Joining us now on the Mar Army Rock Show. You know, I interview so many people, it's hard to, um, I don't get starstruck much anymore, but I got Chasm Sultan with us. And if you don't know a resume that includes Meatloaf, Hall of, Hall of Notes, Joan Jet, Blue Oyster Cult, and of course Utopia, you don't know Chasm yet. So, uh, Chasm, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me, Rocky. I really appreciate it. Oh, man, uh, this is a real pleasure for me. And uh, when I saw what you were doing, I thought, this is a, what a great time to get an artist like you on the show. So tell us a little bit about the Tupelo drive-in experience. You were one of the first people, I think, to do these drive-in concerts. Yeah, I'm, I mean, it was very exciting. I, uh, I got a, a call from my, uh, from my booking agent. And, uh, you know, I do live shows all over the country. And, uh, and, and I was actually on tour in March when everything kind of shut down and within, uh, within the span of about 48 hours went from having another six shows to play on a, on a 16 city tour to driving home. Um, so it was, uh, it, it, it was really, really sad to, to have to, to pull the plug on a tour that was going so well. In any case, so I went, wound up sitting home for two months just trying to figure out what was going on. And I get a phone call, and it's my booking agent, and she says, uh, there's a venue up in New Hampshire that is doing drive-in concerts, uh, and they'd like to know if you'd be interested. She didn't even have to say anything after that. I said, <laughs> yes, absolutely. I don't care where it is. I don't care how far I have to drive. I will be there. And um, so we put it together. Uh, and they had had one show the, the weekend before, and I was the, uh, I was the second live uh, music act that they had. And it just, it was, it was a, a wonderful and exciting experience. So take us through it from your perspective as an artist first. Like, I mean, I obviously I can imagine some of the differences. Like I, I watched the end of the first NASCAR and the guy that won it just said it was so weird not hearing cheering. Like talk about that a little bit. Well, you know, I mean, normally, uh, um, I, I, if I'm playing an, an outdoor venue, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty far from the from the first audience member i mean even if you're playing a shed or uh or even a small theater for that matter you're a good 15 20 feet bef between the stage and the and the first row of audience people in this case uh it was about the same it was maybe 25 30 feet from the stage to the first people that were sitting but the difference was was that the, the people were, were sitting 12 feet apart from each other <laughs> so uh so it was not only that that distance between the stage and the first row of audience members it was also the distance between audience members was uh that was a little disconcerting you know because uh you really really want that feedback from the audience you want that that connection with uh with a crowd and uh we uh, you know even though i didn't have that um i didn't have that 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 kind of intimacy of uh, of being in a in a venue or being in a in a confined area with a lot of people there it it was still great because you could just tell that the audience members were so grateful that there was some live music being played and uh, and I was just thankful to be a part of it. I can tell you we're certainly missing the live music experience now. Now, uh, has, Since that seems like it was a good success, have you thought about doing more such concerts? Are you still thinking about it or are you just going to wait it out till we get back to, I guess we'd say, normal? No, I think that uh, for the most part, I think that uh, concerts pretty much are, are uh, you know, big arena concerts, stadium concerts, and even theater concerts are pretty much done for the summer. Um, hopefully by, by the end of the summer, September, October, we'll start getting back to having venues open up. But I think for the most part, this is going to be um, the new normal. I, I hate using that expression. Yeah, me too, but I, I get normal. why you're using it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, um, but we're just going to have to deal with this for now rather than ra rather than not do it or sit in your in your tv room and you know and, and stare at a laptop not that not that there's anything wrong with that but to watch a, a zoom uh concert or a stage it concert or any one of a number of platforms where artists um are performing live on the internet for their fans i mean that's great and everything like that but there's just something about getting outside or uh, or going out and congregating with a few people um, and uh, and having that experience of community, you know that uh, that we we're lacking right now. Um, so yeah, I, I would love to do more, and I think that there are going to be more of these kind of shows over the next few months. 
uh, until things kind of, you know, creep back to the way that they used to be slowly but surely. Um, but uh, this is what we have right now. So you've got to make the best out of it. Now, as we look ahead a couple months, um, are you working on new music? Are you going to be touring, uh, you know, still some stuff? Uh, I don't know. Do you still play stuff from the album three or do you got new music coming out soon? What, what's, what are you working on writing wise? Uh, I just finished the record. Um, I just completed it. We just finished mixing. Uh, it's an, another record with my, my uh, writing partner, a guy by the name of Phil Thornalley in London. Uh, and uh, it's probably, I, I think it's some of my best work yet. Um, and unfortunately, uh, for me to, to release the record right now would be unfair to the to the album and the work that we've done because I can't go out and promote it. Yeah, you know, yeah. there's no way to get out and uh, and and do promotion for it. So I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait through the summer. I'll probably do some more some more live shows slowly but surely. Venues are opening up, smaller venues, and for me, I can still go out and play. 150 seats, 100 seats, um, 200 seat uh, venue, and, and you know, and make it work for myself. Um, I don't need to have 5,000 people in the audience, you know. Um, so I'm going to try to do to do that over the summer as things open up little by little. Um, and I'll be doing some stuff from the new record in in my next shows. Uh, and that's you know, that's what I can do. That's about all I can do right now. So, uh, I, you know, I'm 53. I've been listening to you as long as I've been listening to music. So I'd love to ask some historical kind of questions here, for lack of a better term. Now, when I was growing up, the first band I ever discovered were the Beatles. And the second was Utopia. So uh, when Deface the Music came out, I was just thrilled with it. And I would love to hear a little more about the story behind it. Um, you know, that record was a, that was a very, very strange thing to do when we did it because I think it goes uh, it, it speaks to the fact that Todd Rundgren who who started Utopia and it was really it was really his baby from uh, from the inception in 1972 till I joined in, in 1976 and then you know hats off to Todd he wanted it to be a more democratic band uh, he wanted other people in the band to have a say in the uh, in the music and uh, in the in the business as well so we when I joined the band it became a, 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 a an equal band four ways uh, everybody owned a quarter of the band um, however it was still Todd's band and uh, and, and so we had the record prior to to um, to deface the music was uh, Adventures in Utopia. It was a huge record for the band. We had uh, we had sold more records for Adventures in Utopia than ever before, uh, and and we felt that that we were on the cusp of of maybe becoming you know really popular as instead instead of just like you know kind of a cultish band uh, uh, that that had a loyal uh, following but not uh, you know we weren't selling out 10,000 seat halls uh, we were doing okay but we we you know we wanted to take it to the next level so we did this record it was extremely successful we had a big hit single on the record set me free was the biggest uh, hit single that the band ever had and um, and, and we were poised to uh, to take our to take the band to the next level. Unfortunately, Todd didn't want to do that. So when it came time to do the next record, Todd said, "Why uh, why would we want to do the same kind of record that we just did? We need to do something completely different." And that's when he said, "I have a great idea. We're going to do a Beatles parody record." And both myself, Willie Wilcox, the drummer, and Roger Powell, the keyboard player, looked at each other and said, "Uh." <laughs> Well, there goes popularity. <laughs> there goes there goes the ten thousand seat arenas. Um, and we did this record. Looking back on it, it was a good record. Um, it was uh, it was a very interesting record. It was an homage to the Beatles. We basically took all of our favorite Beatles songs and rewrote them. Um, uh, but it wasn't the record that the, that the industry wanted. Um, and I think it wound up hurting us more than helping us. So, uh, just for fun, the other day you mentioned "Set Me Free," and I was watching the music video of that the other day. Uh, do you miss that, like MTV era video making kind of stuff? 
You, you know, um, yes and no. Uh, I, you know, I I was always uh, of the mind that uh, you know putting a a, a video together um, was a little. Uh, it, it was a little. It, it, it was kind of cheeky, you know, and you had to be a little different. I mean, we did one video uh, for uh, our, our network album. Uh, one of the singles from the network album was "Feet Don't Fail Me Now," and Love we it. all yeah. dressed up in yeah, we all dressed up in bug costumes. I remember, for, it. yeah, I remember know. it well. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, well, you know, can't we just do a performance? I like performance videos. That's what I like. <laughs> so anytime that that a band tries to get a little creative uh, and and you know, do something a little bit out of left field. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, my feeling is, you know what? Save that for uh, for Scorsese movies, or <laughs> you know, or, or uh, something that has a little bit more artistic meaning. Because we're just a rock band, and we're just trying to, you know, trying to promote the music along and putting some some images along with the music. And uh, you know, I. I, I I just I, not that I have a problem with videos, but uh, I, I, I'm of I'm of the mind that just set up somewhere, play the, play the song, sing it, let us see that, let the audience <laughs> see you doing that. That's all your thanks. See you later. Goodbye. Now, um, I, you know, I've been a huge Todd Rundgren fan as long as I can remember as well. Now, when people hear "Set Me Free" in a lot of songs, how often do people like confuse the fact that it's you versus Todd singing? And when you do write a song, how did you guys pick who sang which songs? Lead. Um, I mean, you know, it, it, it it's kind of like a, uh, it it. it it is a foregone conclusion when you hear a piece of music whose voice would work best for that piece of music. So there were songs that uh, that we did over the years where, uh, when when the song was written, we we uh, we had an idea who might sing it. But once the track was done, it was like, oh, this is definitely a Willie song. Oh, Roger is definitely going to sing this song. Um, uh, this is a Kaz song, and of course, this is a Todd song. You know, like a song like "Made It" from uh, POV. That is uh, that's just that begs for the kind of Philly blue eyed soul that that Todd brings to the table. Uh, a song like "You Make Me Crazy" from Adventures in Utopia. This kind mm -hmm. of quirky, kooky little song uh, that's kind of a little like if I had to liken it to any other song, it would be like with a little help from my friends. Yeah. Um, that would be you know that. That just said that had Willie Wilcox written all over it. Um, so you know, once you finish a song, you finish the writing process for the song, then it kind of it, it kind of tells you who is the best voice for it. Now I mentioned uh, Meatloaf, and people may or may not know you were on Bad Out of Hell. I, I just gotta wonder when that record was being made. You could not have had an idea what that thing was going to be, did you? No, um, as a matter of fact, when, when when we started working on that record, I, um, I, I, my, you know, my mouth was open the whole time. I just could not believe that somebody was was writing these the, these kind of songs, these epic, um, you know. Well, I think that out of hell is like eleven minutes long, mm -hmm. um, or, or any, anything for love is, is eleven minutes long. That's for sure. I'm not sure how long that out of hell is, but <laughs> in any case, to your point. Um, it, it was uh, it was not something that I had been used to doing, and God bless you know Todd and and his production uh, sense that he made he made those songs what they what they turned out to be, you know they were basically when we sat down to learn them they were just piano demos it was just Jim Steinman sitting at the piano playing the song, uh, Meatloaf singing it and uh, and Rory Dodd one of the background vocalists Ellen Foley the other background vocalist uh, doing background parts uh, and, and and you know it was it was completely Todd's vision um, that he took these songs and just said okay this is how we're going to approach it now when we finished that record I, I i thought for sure that i would never hear it again ever <laughs> in a million years and now <laughs> and, and i tell the story that about a year and a half after i after we finished the record and it was released uh, I was in uh, I was in a, a car I was in my car driving from New York City up to Woodstock to start a Utopia record or U Utopia tour, and I heard something that was vaguely familiar on the radio. I, I 
And I couldn't put my finger on where I heard it until about a minute and a half into the song. And I said, oh, I know what that song is. That is the song that I played uh, on, on the record. I played on that record. Oh, isn't that great? <laughs> Those guys got their record on the radio. That's so wonderful. I feel so grateful. for. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy for them. What a wonderful thing. And now uh, something like 46 million records later. You know, uh, that's one of the classic albums of all time. Uh, I'd like to just ask you one or two more things. I know your time's valuable here, but um, hey, uh, you played also with uh, just your connections to some of my favorite artists. I've been a huge Joan Jett fan my whole life, Baltimore uh-huh. native. Um, but just how did that come to be? How'd you hook it? What was the experience like working with Joan? Uh, you know, I love Joan. Uh, she was absolutely a pleasure to work with. Um, she uh, was, uh, she was completely focused on what what Joan Jett music is, you know, and it's this kind of punky, uh, attitude-y, uh, rock, he- you know, not not heavy rock, but hard rock. Um, and uh, and she, it, it, whenever we went on stage, whenever, uh, at any tour, any gig, she gives 120%. Um, I just, uh, I, I was introduced to, to Joan through my friend Tommy Price, who was a, a, a drummer, um, and was uh, was thinking about joining her band at the time. Joan needed a bass player. I happened to be between gigs, and uh, I just uh, I, I fell into it, and I wound up spending about three and a half years with with her. And it, it was just it was a really really wonderful time playing with Joan. So uh, one last thing here. I know um, of folks that don't know it yet, you have some really cool solo stuff. And I mentioned earlier the album three came out back in 2014. Um, I wanted to ask you, I hope it's a cool question, but tell me a little bit about the song 15 Minutes. Is that about an actual person or is it more just a social kind of commentary? Well, you know, back in uh, in the um, in the mid two thousand, like 2005, 2004, 2005, 2006, um, that it was the the onslaught of uh, of reality television shows, and uh, and especially like a Paris Hilton, uh, who basically became famous for uh, for nothing. <laughs> I mean, really, she really was. She really didn't contribute anything to society to become famous for. She didn't write a book. I mean, maybe she's written a book since. I don't know. She was, Probably. She's not a recording. She's not a recording artist. Although maybe she's recorded a song or two. Um, but basically, she was just famous for being famous. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, and back in the sixties, um, uh, Andy Warhol uh, made a comment that. Uh, you know, sometime in the future, everybody's going to be famous for 15 minutes. And and that's exactly what happened. Uh, it took a few years for it to happen, but, it, you know, we uh, cut to the early 2000s and mid-2010 uh, and on. And there's all, you know, the Kardashians and uh, the, you know, the, the Beverly Hills uh, the, the Housewives and uh, well, the Real Housewives and all these shows, uh, these reality shows of people that that really aren't famous for anything other than being famous. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely, man. Well, um, hey, Chasm Sultan, everybody. I had a great time talking. It's an honor to get to meet you. And uh, check out uh, when Torin fires back up. <laughs> we'll look yes. for Chasm back out on the road again and new music. So uh, thanks so much for sharing the drive-in experience with it with us, and I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Stay safe out there, and I'll see you all real soon.